Welcome to the Dance Data Trail video engaging with the SESTA Data Archiving Guide. In this video, we will give an introduction to this new resource for archival employees and talk you through the different chapters and topics it contains. We will also share about our own policies and workflows here at Dance and how these correspond to the content and recommendations made in the guide. We do this with the expert help of our Data Station Manager for the Social Sciences, Dr. Ricardo Brauchmann, and our data processing team leader, Valentine Gillissen. In this video, we will also pose questions for you to consider with regards to your own archive. If you are watching this video after its premiere, you can replay the live chat from the first viewing next to the video. Please also feel free to share your opinions, experiences, and recommendations in the comment section below to join the conversation. This video is created by Dans the Data Archiving and Network Services. We are the Dutch National Center of Expertise and Repository for Research Data. DANS is an institute of the Royal Netherlands Academy of the Arts and Sciences and the Dutch Research Council. DANS is a research data service provider with a focus on gathering, embedding, and sharing expertise on research data management, fair data, open access, and trustworthiness. It is our mission to enhance the reusability of research data and thus the quality of scientific research. The three pillars of our identity are to be a versatile repository, a center of expertise, and an active collaborator. The first pillar can be seen in our discipline-specific repositories, our data stations. Here, we ingest, curate, and preserve data for the long term with dedicated attention to the needs of specific communities. As a national service provider, DANS is a member of SESTA, the Consortium of European Social Science Data Archives. This European Research Infrastructure Consortium brings together social science data archives across Europe with the aim of promoting and supporting national and international research and cooperation. As DANS has firm roots in the discipline of social sciences, we have been an active member and collaborator of SESTA for many years. With its mission of supporting continuous learning and training of the social science community, as well as focusing on research data management, data discovery and reuse, digital preservation and data archiving, trust and technology, SESA aligns perfectly with our interests. Over the course of its existence, SESTA has created many useful tools and resources for its service providers and the social sciences community at large. A recent addition to this lineup is the Data Archiving Guide, or the DAG. This resource is designed to provide new employees at social science data archives with a general understanding of the work a data archive performs. As an active collaborator of SESTA, DANS helped to realize this resource by creating and curating parts of its content. As a service provider of SESTA, this guide can be used by DANS to inform new employees at the Data Station Social Science and Humanities about some of the processes and workflows that they will work with and what their relevance is to the community that we serve. As a center of expertise, we used our DANS Data Trail communication mechanism in this video to showcase this new SESTA resource to the wider community and to also inform you about the way DANS implements the information and recommendations into our data stations. DANS Data Trails are events that give us the opportunity to share the experiences and expertise we acquire with relevant communities, as well as receive feedback and input from our audience on specific services, products, or plans. The DANS data trails are also a way for us to be creative and explore new ways of creating content and engaging with our audience. In this video, we share our expertise on the different topics covered in the data archiving guide, as well as our opinion of this new resource for the social science community. We will take you through each of the chapters currently available in the guide and show you how you can use this resource for your own archive and the training of new employees. We also share some considerations, discussions, and processes of our own repository and would like to invite you to do the same about yours.
Chapter 1 is a quick introduction to data archives in the format of frequently asked questions, and this chapter was created by Dunce. There are currently 11 questions within Chapter 1, ranging from broad questions such as what is an archive and what does an archive look like, to more specific questions related to the archiving process as well as relevant legislation. Let's take a look at question 1.1, what is an archive? In this answer, we start off by saying that a data archive is not just a storage place for data, and then continue into the complex archiving activities undertaken by data archives. Throughout the DOV, you will find these color blocked sections, find out more about your archive. These sections contain prompts that you can use to build upon your understanding of your own archive and how it relates to the objectives within the DOV. Another FAQ of interest may be question 1.9. What are relevant legislations in relation to data archiving? where both copyright as well as the General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR, are addressed with further resources and prompts for you to access. Because the DOG was written by several different service providers within the SESDA community, question 1.11 on the tools that archives use contains a fairly diverse list of tools and resources that are used by different organizations, and this list is by no means exhaustive. These lists can seem overwhelming when you first access the DOG, but they can be a useful reference later. So we've discussed a few questions here. But how would we be answering these questions at Dance? The basic idea of an archive would be a place to stash your stuff and to retrieve your stuff once it's in there. So the basic idea of a digital archive would be the same for data. You store your digital files there and the archive should have options for accessibility and for browsing and searching, uh, not only your data but also other data. Uh, but when we come to the question, what is a good digital archive, that's where things get more interesting because then you will be talking about uh, FAIR principles, making the data findable, interoperable, accessible and reusable. You will be talking about the OAS, the Open Archive Information System Reference Model, which identifies all sorts of aspects that digital archives need to take, to take into account. And that allows us all over the world to speak the same language when it comes to data archives. It also allows us to certify archives as trusted digital repositories. And that, in my opinion, is a good data archive. Uh, an archive which is at least, at the very least, certified with a core trust seal and performs its duties according to the FAIR principles. Why is archiving important? Archiving is important because it allows us to safely store data that is very valuable. So there's a lot of research data out there that can be reused by others. And it's really important to make sure that this data is stayed somewhere safe and also for the long term. Because you can imagine that the researcher might leave their original lab to go somewhere else and then the data would go with them. But um, that makes it like very inaccessible. And an archive tries to ensure that this data is saved in a central space and also stored there for a long term. This means that an archive ensures that the data can be accessible even when the researcher moves to another institute. But it also means that we ensure that um, the data is stored in a way that it will be accessible in the future. So for instance, ensuring that it has the right formats. And an archive doesn't only store the data, it also makes it available for reuse so that data that is collected for a specific purpose can be reused by others, we can replicate research, and in the end we can also save a lot of money by reusing existing data that is already out there. So we've discussed a couple of questions here, but how would you be answering these questions? Why is archiving important to you and your organization?
Chapter 2, Policies of Data Archives. This chapter covers the topic of the policies and documentation needed for the daily operations of an archive. The chapter focuses on the policies that would typically be in place at a social science archive. Policies can be very useful, and in some cases mandatory, to clarify an archive's commitment to certain standards, legislations, or ideologies. They can also be used as evidence when looking to obtain a formal certificate, such as the Court Trustee Certificate of Trustworthiness. The chapter divides policies into several different topics. Data collection and data acquisition policies describe the selection and appraisal criteria that an archive applies when assessing whether to accept or reject data into their collection. Preservation policies determine the rules, responsibilities, roles, and the system of monitoring data management within the archive. Data curation policies detail the workflow of the curation process an archive uses to manage their data. Data access policies describe the different access conditions that the archive supports, with information on what each one entails and when they are suitable to be applied. And lastly, data dissemination policies can include commitments and responsibilities to the dissemination and safeguarding of data once it's in the archive's care. For each one of these policies, the DAG provides information and criteria of the policies, links to examples, and tips on what to consider when creating your own policy. Learning more about the policies that are in place in your archive is essential to be able to carry out your activities there. With the basic information from this chapter in the DAG, you can consider what policies are in place at your archive and what they look like. Are there policies mentioned in a chapter that your archive does not have? And if so, what are the reasons you may not create a policy or documentation for this process? Alternatively, your archive may have more or different policies than described here. How can you evaluate these policies and appreciate their impact? Looking at examples from other archives, are there ways to improve your current documentation to potentially make your workflows more efficient? Chapter 2 provides the information and links you need to consider all of this. Now, how do we handle policies at DANS? What level or levels of curation does DANS perform and what policies are in place? Depositors deposit their own datasets into our archive agreeing to the terms of use for our archiving system. They also agree to the data stations policy we have in place, which identifies DANS as a curator of the data and as a service provider. Um, it identifies DANS as performing its duties in accordance with legal and regulatory requirements, um, adhering to the FAIR principles and supporting open science as open as possible, as close as necessary. Now, all manual deposits into our archive undergo basic curation. That means that they will be checked by a data manager. Um, the, de the depositors are asked to check our website and follow our guidelines uh, also on uh, in regards to the file formats they deposit, to check our preferred file formats guidelines. Uh, depending if these guidelines are followed or not, what kind of data content is delivered, we may opt to go for enhanced curation on datasets. Now, this is for manual deposits of datasets. It is also possible to have an automated machine-to-machine -machine interface with our archive. In that case, the datasets will be sent directly into our archive, bypassing our curation, uh, our curation steps. Uh, so then, um, any basic curation needs to be done alternatively beforehand, either through a pilot test sampling of, uh, of whatever machine-to-machine -machine connection is uh, being used, or um, by having an external front office, front desk, dealing with all the data deposits. To elaborate on another type of policies from this chapter, what policies does DANS have on data access? So when it comes to data access, in our data session, you can choose to either publish a data set open access or restricted access. And open access means that anyone without logging in, can download the data. And for open access datasets, we have a set of licenses that people can uh, use for their datasets, typically the Creative Commons licenses. Most uh, known license is probably the CC BY license, 
where you require people reusing data to cite your, uh, you as the person making the data available. And on the other hand, so you have open access data sets, you can also choose to restrict um, either the whole data set or parts of your data set. And this might be useful if your data set contains personal information or sensitive information, and if you want to know who is using your data. And in these cases, for restricted access data sets, um, the depositor can allow an access request, and that means that a user has to log in and request access, and after the depositor has granted access, the user can download the data sets. In our archive, it's also possible to restrict access without allowing an access request, which basically means that the files are closed, that nobody can access those. Um, and we have special, a special license for all restricted access data sets, which is the DUNS license. The, even though we allow both open and restricted access, we do encourage uh, everybody to publish as open as possible and as closed as necessary. Now let's consider a different topic of policies as an exercise. What factors can you think of that affect the long-term preservation of data? What would you have to include in your archives preservation policy to address this? Let's continue to chapter three, free ingest from early contact to data transfer. This chapter covers what data archives do to ensure that incoming data meet the criteria of data collection and quality requirements. This chapter introduces the Open Archiving Information System or OAIS framework. This standard describes an archive with all the systems and processes that it contains and many archives align themselves with this model in their workflows. Ironically, free ingest is not part of this model, as it starts at the ingest phase, when a data producer submits data to an archive. The pre-ingest phase has been informally added to this model by many archives to cover the preparations that need to be made before the ingest phase. A well-executed pre-ingest can make the lives of archival staff much easier, as the curation process should be quite uncomplicated when the right preparations have been made. The timeline of pre-ingest starts when a data producer starts producing data. Anything that adds to the organization, quality, and formatting of the data works towards a smoother ingest and curation process. For the archive, at this stage, you can consider engaging in outreach and support to contact data producers and make them aware of how they can set themselves up for a great archiving process from the start of their data production. The next step is data submission, where an archive can assist by making sure depositors are well informed on the process through documentation or a well-designed and secure user interface. Next, it is the responsibility of the archive to review and appraise the submission made. This can be done based on the data collection and data acquisition policies mentioned in Chapter 2. In Chapter 3, you will learn some more about what to consider and how to communicate with the depositor at this stage. The last phase of the pre-ingest process is to make the decision of accepting or rejecting the submission made. Each section of Chapter 3 walks you through each phase of the pre-ingest process. This is supported with a video from SESTA Training and the UK Data Service on pre-ingest. For each section of the chapter, you are linked to the relevant clip of the video to further support your understanding of it. Overall, Chapter 3 is a useful tool for learning about the OAIS model and its unofficial phase of pre-ingest.
placing the processes and activities that may be in place at your archive in the context of this model emphasizes the importance of them and the underlying motivation. With that, let's hear about what pre-ingest phase looks like at the DANS archives. DANS has a self-depositing archive. The depositors can go to our archiving system, our data stations, and fill in the metadata scheme and upload their files and send the data set to us. And then basic curation happens in between the data submissions and the publication of the data set. And that means that at DANS, the pre-ingest function is identified or more or less or not detailed by the OAS because most of the pre-ingest happens before the OAS model uh, is featured. Um, the, that pre-ingest phase and the ingest phase actually overlap because of, of all this work being done before publication. And there may be lots of contact with the depositor before publication. Actually, the, the SIP, the Submission Information Package, is created by um, the depositor in accordance with the dance curator, possibly with back and forth communication, uh, in case we have questions, in case we, uh, we ask for different formats or additions to the metadata. Uh, so there may, may be a lot of contact beforehand. People also come to us with questions. They contact us directly or uh, the data curators at DANS also maintain the general info at DANS email. Um, we have documentation on the website guiding, uh, guiding depositors to submit the best data sets, uh, the data sets as, as good as they can. And uh, the curation staff is also responsible for, uh, for maintaining these documents. Um, acquisition may also happen at DANS. It's something that is then done by the data station managers if they, uh, they know um, of sources that may provide very good data sets to us. With the setup of the DANS data stations, we have data station managers that are responsible for the outreach to and support of the designated community. So what does that look like for the DANS social science data station? How does DANS reach out to and support the community during the pre-ingest phase? We support the community in various ways. So the most obvious way uh, is basically our website. So our website contains a lot of information and also a detailed guide on how to use our archive with guidance on uh, preparing your data set before submission, the whole submission process, but also information on reusing data. So our website is a, is a go-to place for all kinds of information. And our website also has a help desk function. So if anybody has a question, they can use the website to get in touch with us. And then myself or somebody from our archi archiving team will be getting in touch with people to answer their questions. We also started a weekly open hour on Monday morning from 10 to 11. We are online available for any sort of questions that uh, researchers or data stewards might have. Uh, so this is something we've established to give an open space for, for the community to come in. We also organize a lot of trainings and events, um, also like this one, where we try to reach out to the, to the community and tell them about the work that we've been doing in our archive and how it functions. And lastly, we are involved in various projects, um, international and national projects, where we develop materials, information for our community around all kinds of aspects of archiving and fair data. Just recently, for instance, we published a guide on working with qualitative data and making qualitative data reusable which would be helpful for um, people from the community working with interview data, for instance. Let's reflect on this topic a bit more. How can your archive reach out to and support your community in the pre-ingest phase?
Chapter 4 asks the question, what steps are necessary to guarantee high-quality data and metadata? This often means detailed and documented workflows, as well as handover steps where necessary. When the pre-ingest phase and the ingest phase are separate entities at an archive, there is often a handover step. And the first part of Chapter 4 goes into some issues to consider during the handover. It's important to check for necessary files, the data sensitivity of the data set or its parts, as well as the eligibility of the data for its desired repository, where applicable. The difference between the pre-ingest and ingest step depends on the size and breadth of the archive undertaking the curation. It's also here where internal backups and documentation are important, and the chapter itself covers various elements that you can consider. Often hot topics, both the file formats accepted as well as the mode of transfer of data, is entirely up to the archive and can depend on the available resources as well as the desires of the designated community. Finally, there are data deposit agreements to consider and what level of curation and security is necessary for the dataset based on the data deposit agreement. Is it open or is it closed? And if so, how is access determined? Is there an embargo? Etc. Once these handover steps are underway, the ingest and curation can begin. Though the process varies between archives, the overview provided in Section 7 of Chapter 4 is a handy way of viewing the workflow, as well as where elements can vary. You can take this flowchart and see how it applies to your own organization's workflow, as well as looking at the accompanying resources. For instance, there is also an example of the data lifecycle log from the Austrian Soci Social Science Data Archive, which may be of interest to you in your archive. In the final part of Chapter 4, there are three major topics where more detail is available. Metadata, quality assurance, and versioning. The importance of metadata cannot be overlooked, and so the doc goes into some examples of standards as well as vocabularies or thesauri. The SESDA vocabulary service is an additional tool that you can use here. Quality assurance is key to maintaining the quality of an archive, as well as ensuring that the archive is compliant with the General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR, such as issues of data or file compatibility are also important, and plausibility of data. The amount of curation in quality assurance depends on the archive, the diversity of data, and available resources. Finally, this chapter discusses what is possible based on different versioning policies of the archive, as well as the use of persistent identifiers, such as digital object identifiers or DOIs. This is definitely one of the more detailed chapters of the doc, and Chapter 4 on ingest and curation is best considered alongside the existing policies at your archive to see how they are communicated with staff and users alike, as well as if there are any additions or alterations that you can make. But how about some more questions? Valentine, what does the curation workflow look like at Dunce? All manual deposits into our archive undergo basic curation, at least, which means that the data curator will look at the data set and process it according to an internal processing document. And that means that we will check the metadata um, and the data set to see if it's a valid data set and if it's complete as far as we can see, if it can be understood by anyone or if it's missing metadata or content, or if it's, it, it might be an unclear data set, it might be unclear why the depositor deposited this data set, it might not be a research data set as we identify it, in which case we will contact the depositor with questions. Um, then we will review the metadata, which uh, may involve us making minor corrections or improvements to the metadata. We are free to do that. Uh, to make it more uh, fair, more findable, more, uh, uh, more reusable. Um, so we may fix typos, we may add some metadata fields that were missing, we may um, uh, correct metadata fields which were filled in incorrectly. We also check if there is privacy sensitive data included, and if there is, well then that is mainly the responsibility of the depositor, but we do check if the chosen access conditions and settings match what we see, uh, or if maybe some personal data um, is about to be published uh, on open access, then we might still contact the depositor to double check with them, is this really what you want? 
Um, we then checked for the far content of the data set uh, to see if the files deposited match with our guidelines on preferred file formats for the long-term accessibility and reusability. If not, we may contact the depositor to check if other formats can be delivered or we may decide depending on our possibilities and options um, to our availability. Uh, we may uh, go for enhanced curations and, um, and, and add migrations of the file formats to the data set as a new version. And after publication, um, and if we want to undergo, um, if we want to perform enhanced curation, we will publish the dataset first. Then after pu publication, every edit to the dataset will result in a new version. The, the dataset will retain its persistent identifier and the citation. Um, the user will be informed which version is the latest version, will automatically be directed to the latest version. And there's a tab where you can see all the other versions of the data set and what the differences are between the versions. Uh, if uh, after publication there's an update to the metadata, it will result in a minor revision, which means a version from version 1 to version 1.1. 1 .1. Uh, if there's any change in the file content or in the accessibility of the files, it will be a major revision. Then there will be a change from version 1 to version 2. And Ricarda, how important is metadata for data and archiving? Metadata really is crucial. So without metadata, no one will be able to understand your data set and nobody will be able to find it, reuse it. So really to make data fair and to make data archiving useful, we need as much and as detailed metadata as possible. So we always encourage people to take the extra 10 minutes to fill in most of the fields. Anything you can add is really very valuable. And it's also important to use metadata that is domain specific. So for instance, our data station has metadata specifically tailored to the social sciences, including the ELS thesaurus and some topic classification lists from SESTA. And it's really useful if people take the time to select a term from this list and add it to the metadata, because in this way we can have a structured overview of all kinds of data sets that belong to the same category or to the same topic. And the metadata that we collect for the data sets are also very important because we use them to make data findable in larger catalogs. So for instance, the metadata that we collect at DANS is also fed into national catalogs developed by the Odyssey Consortium and also the SESTA data catalog. So really, we need all of the metadata in order to make the data sets findable in our own archive, but also nationally and internationally. Suffice it to say, complete metadata is very important for the curation and eventual reuse of data collections. What are the requirements of your archive with regards to metadata? From metadata to FAIR data, the final chapter of the doc is about the FAIR principles and how archives are an important player in FAIR and open data spaces, both in internal processes as well as by supporting FAIR with their designated communities. This chapter was written by Don Staff and features insights from both Don's operations as well as that of other SESDA service providers. The chapter begins by introducing the topic of FAIR and its history, as well as going into detail about what a FAIR enabling organization can look like. First off, though, what is FAIR? This image can be found in the SESDA DMAG, the Data Management Expert Guide, which discusses how to make data FAIR. Within the doc, we instead focus on why these principles are important, their different formulations in regards to archiving, and how they came to be. Essentially, the FAIR principles are the way to get everyone involved in data management, 
not just archives who are adhering to the open archival information system model. And it's good to have everyone speaking the same language when it comes to the topic of research data management and FAIR. The uptake of FAIR does not only consist of a cultural change, but also necessitates a technical infrastructure. FAIR data can only exist in a FAIR ecosystem, or which consists of FAIR enabling organizations and services. The term FAIR enabling can be used to indicate that an organization or service can influence the level of fairness of a digital object, but that the organization itself cannot be fair in the sense that the FAIR principles cannot be applied to it. So we say that a data archive can be FAIR enabling. This is addressed in two different ways further in Chapter 5. First, how do you enable FAIR within your organization? And second, how do you support FAIR with your designated community? Let's look at the first one. Section 2 of Chapter 5 addresses one of the main ways that archives can determine how FAIR enabling their organization is, particularly through the use of assessment frameworks. We give two examples of automatic assessment tools that were used by two different archives within the SESDA network. First, we look at the Fuji Automated FAIR Data Assessment Tool, and the second example is the FAIR Maturity Testing and Evaluation Tool from the FAIR Metrics Group. Both examples feature interviews or snippets from says to service providers and their experience with the tools. In Chapter 5, Section 3 deals with supporting FAIR with your designated communities. For this chapter, the DONTS authors surveyed the SESTA community to see how different service providers approached FAIR in their own policies, and we found that there were two approaches that were not mutually exclusive but rather complementary. First, actively promoting FAIR and the FAIR principles to their users, such as by hosting events or communications directly with their users about what FAIR is and why it's important. And the second would be by embedding FAIR within their organization in user-facing infrastructure, aiming for a seamless integration of the FAIR principles without burdening users. Both of these approaches are fundamental in FAIR enabling organizations, and they can complement each other as well. Chapter 5 goes into further detail and provides several examples across the SESTA community, so you can take a look and see if there are examples that you might want to take on to your community. The final section of Chapter 5 discusses trustworthiness and how it applies to archives. This chapter includes discussions on the trust principles, certification such as the core trust seal, and how fair enabling and trust intersect. Now, for this final chapter, let's check in with our DANS colleagues specifically to talk about fair enabling and promoting fair to our users. First, Valentine, how does DANS monitor and improve its fair enabling qualities? We start with the letter F, findability. Findability is mostly found in the metadata of the data set. Good and complete metadata, well overseeable metadata, uh, which we support uh, with our with our archiving system by having uh, good metadata fields with which the depositor can describe them, the data set. Um, and also uh, we incorporated um, vocabularies in the metadata uh, from communities like archaeology. We have some archaeological uh, national vocabulary terms included in the metadata. And that means that the metadata is filled in in a standardized manner. And of course, during the basic curation, we check the metadata of a data set. So uh, that is also some extra effort where we, uh, where we uh, really take care of the findability of the data set. Um, accessibility, that is all about the access conditions of the data set and the licenses. Uh, we support that with offering uh, a range of licenses to the depositor, like um, uh, mostly Creative Commons licenses. Um, you can, uh, you can have a, a data set published on CC0 in the public domain, but also CC BY, uh, CC BY share alike, CC BY non commercial. Um, and uh, there's, there are also options to, um, to restrict accessibility to individual files of a data set, to place an embargo on files. And of course, we check on the settings and if that matches with. Uh, maybe personal data being included in the data set or not. Um, interoperability is 
for me mostly found in the use of the right file formats. Um, uh, that for that we have our preferred files, uh, uh, preferred file format um, guidance document um, to guide people to use the best format suited for long-term accessibility and usability. And uh, we support that not only with this document, but also sometimes with enhanced curation where we add migrations of the file formats as a new version of the dataset. Reusability is found in everything that we do. Everything that we do is aimed to having reusable scientific datasets. It should also be mentioned here that DANS is part of the National Preservation Watch within the Dutch Digital Heritage Network. And along with our colleagues in there, we monitor any developments in digital archiving uh, that, uh, that may occur, like uh, changes in use of, of certain file formats. And Ricarda, how does DANS promote FAIR to its community and users? We promote FAIR in various ways, including um, what I mentioned earlier, our website and our help desk and the information we provide. But we also are involved in a lot of projects that deal with FAIR and the implementation of the FAIR principles. In the past, we, for instance, uh, started working on the FAIRWARE tool, which is a tool that helps uh, researchers and others to assess their knowledge of FAIR and the FAIR principles. Um, we also have been involved in quite a lot of technical developments around FAIR. And for instance, the Fuji tool uh, is one of the things that um, has been developed in projects in which DANS was also involved, which is an uh, automatic assessment of the fairness of repositories and data sets um, that is very important uh, to measure FAIR. And of course, we also support FAIR in being a trustworthy digital repository. Um, we use Dataverse as a software, and by using that and by archiving uh, data with us, you already tick a lot of boxes on the FAIR uh, implementation. So for instance, we assign persistent identifiers to a data set. We have the metadata that is machine readable. We add vocabularies that are controlled. So in this way, uh, our repository environment also supports FAIR by itself. Those are some examples of how DANS supports their community with the FAIR principles. But what about your archive? What does your archive do to promote FAIR with its users and community or embed FAIR within its infrastructure? With this, we have come to the end of our journey through the current chapters of the Data Archiving Guide. We hope this has given you some insight into how you can use the guide to familiarize yourself or new employees with your archive and its practices. You are also welcome to use this video to introduce your staff to the guide and use the discussion questions we post to you as an opportunity to discuss your archive and practices together. You may find some inspiration in the chat and comments from other archives as well. Now, looking at the Data Archiving Guide as a whole in its current shape, let's ask our experts their opinion on the resource and how it can be applied to our own DANS data stations. It's a great source of information. There's a lot in it and it's well structured, so you don't uh, think of it as a huge load of text to go through. Yeah, I think so as well. I think it's really a very nice tool and you can find all the kinds of information that you need and I think we can probably use it for our archive staff for new people who need to learn about what dance is and how we support FAIR. Definitely because also dance is very well presented within the, the DAR as what we do our purposes and why it is important that we do that. Yeah 
So thanks for creating this. We will definitely use it. After these considerations, we pose you one last question to consider. What do you think of the DAG and what will you do with it in your organization? Thank you for watching this Dance Data Trail video on engaging with the SESTA Data Archiving Guide. We appreciate your feedback on the video and the guide, so feel free to leave a comment with your thoughts. Subscribe to the Dance YouTube channel to keep informed about other videos we put out. Follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and sign up for our newsletter data link via the website to keep up to date with our latest developments. If you want to learn more about us or get in touch, find us on www dance.knaw.nl